Hello and welcome to a new episode of Mind Expanding Russian. This time I'm going to talk to you about the difference between microdosing and macrodosing, but mainly I will be talking about microdosing and various protocols that exist. I will also cover the amount of the portion or the dosage for both micro and macrodose, as well as protocols, and I will touch the topic on whether or not the protocol in itself or microdosing in the first place is effective in terms of the therapeutic potential. So as you remember, this podcast in particular is dedicated to an overview of the therapeutic potential of entheogens to treat various mental illnesses, such as anxiety, PTSD, ADHD, various forms of depression, and not only that, as well as literal physical pains. But I'm not definitely promoting consumption of illegal substances, I'm just informing people about the knowledge that is available out there. However, there are jurisdictions or countries where some substances are not illegal, meaning they're either legal and you can buy them, or they are decriminalized meaning the possession of them is not prohibited by law. Let's dig into it. The reason I wanted to talk to you about microdosing is that it's a quite popular topic and it's been widely not only discussed but touched in various locations of the world but mainly in the United States of course and in particularly in Silicon Valley. It is considered that microdosing has a strong effect in, on creativity, on focus and other aspects, and in this episode you'll know whether or not it's true, because I've read several clinical studies that specifically targeted microdosing as a protocol of consumption of entheogens. So first let's talk about the substances here. As you remember, the entheogen list is quite extensive, although there is a standard list of entheogens such as LSD, psilocybin, or actually psilocin is the active substance that is left in the body after the psilo psilocybin has been processed by the digestive system. There is ayahuasca, DMT, there is ibogaine, and there is a whole lot of other substances such as MDMA, ketamine, 5-MeO-DMT, marijuana, and of course, there are Shulgin's children in the amounts of hundreds of them, but in order to understand the microdosing and the macrodosing, we need to focus. The amount of entheogens being studied in the therapeutic potential is very different due to various reasons. So when we're talking or when I'm talking about micro or macrodosing in this particular episode, I will be talking about two substances. One of them is LSD, also known as lysergic diethylamide, um, produced by Albert Hoffman back in 1938 for the first time, and then consumed in 1943 for the first time. And psilocybin, that is in psilocybin mushrooms, or so-called magic mushrooms, located in the majority of cases in American continents, but not only there, you can also find those type of mushrooms. There is like 200 roughly species of those type of mushrooms that has psilocybin in them spread across the world. A vast majority of studies dedicated to the therapeutic potential of entheogens in healing various types of mental illnesses such as anxiety, ADHD, various forms of depression, PTSD, and others, as well as treating physical pains. But not many clinical trials are studying microdosing in particular. However, there were several of them, and I've studied and went through them and tried to gather data that would be helpful here to understand how it all works. There are various claims that microdosing helps bring focus, and get a better concentration or get more creative energy or something like that. We'll see about that. So let's dig further into the microdosing. So as you understand, micro stands for something small and it's not like literally one tenth of something, but it is a indeed small part of the substance unlike a heroic dose. 
So microdosing is limited to a certain amount of quantity of a substance and it's sub perception level. When you're microdosing, you are consuming a very small amount of a substance, meaning that it doesn't affect your visual systems or your judgment or your thinking or reaction. However, it is not advised to, of course, operate machinery or work in an environment where the reaction is required. Of course, it is better to be prepared and ask your physician, ideally, but please be mindful and be cautious about using this or that protocol in your life. So let's talk about LSD and psilocybin. What are the amounts of the portions or dosages for microdosing for LSD? There is no gold standard here. However, in the majority of cases, you will learn that the size varies from 10 to 20 micrograms. For your understanding, the size of a macrodose or heroic dose starts with 150 micrograms for LSD and goes typically all the way up to 300 micrograms. Above that, it is probably going to be a very difficult trip. Not necessarily, but definitely going to be intense. For psilocybin, situation is slightly different depending on what you're looking at, whether you're looking at the pure substance or you are trying to weigh mushrooms in shape of like either mushrooms or psilocybin truffles that are being sold in Netherlands, for example. So the amount of psilocybin in microdosing protocol is varying from 720 milligrams to one and a half gram of mushrooms okay mushrooms so let me repeat that from 720 milligram milli m-i-l-i to one and a half grams of mushrooms not the psilocybin itself both dosages are considered for a weight of 70 kilos and of course it is it's going to vary, but I wouldn't suggest doubling your doses if your weight is 140 kilograms, because it is also considered that the effect on the brain is the same. However, it is not that studied, so I'm not sure really. But in the majority of cases, whenever you see the amount of dose, you can see the mention there is that it is per 70 kilos. So what is macrodosing then? For So for LSD, the ratio is from 150 to 250 actually, or in rare cases, 300 micrograms of the substance. And remember, it is extremely potent. So the portions and the dosages is very different from psilocybin, which is 20 to 40 grams of mushrooms, grams of mushrooms, from 20 to 40 grams of mushrooms, or from 10 to 40 milligrams, okay, of substance. So those are the dosages, but it is roughly one-tenth. So microdosing is roughly one-tenth of macrodosing. But the mistake people typically make when they're trying to microdose an LSD, if they get a LSD on a blotter paper, and this is what is quite common, is that LSD is being served as a street or underground drug on a piece of blotter that has LSD on it. Basically, is just water drop that is placed on top of that blotter paper. The problem with blotter paper is that it's not distributed evenly. So if you take it and try to cut it in like 10 portions and think that this is like then dosages of microdosing, it's not going to work like that because some of them are going to be extremely potent, whereas others may not even have a substance on it at all. So it's not an even distribution. Nowadays, you can buy semi-legal variations of LSD called 1D LSD, and there's like dozens of them. They are being produced in... Uh, countries like Netherlands or Germany, and you can order them online, but of course better don't do it. So those are the macrodose, and I'm, got no, I'm not going to discuss macrodosing this time because this is a topic for a separate episode. So why do people take microdosing? So the purposes and goals are pretty much as follows, to get a better focus, 
to increase productivity, uh, increase concentration or deep work, let's put it this way, to enhance mood, to improve creativity and alleviate depression symptoms, basically. But of course, remember, never, ever, ever combine psychedelics with SSRIs. And if you have a schizophrenia or bipolar disease, I would advise you to not do it. Remember about the safety measures, they are mentioned in one of my episodes. Just go there and watch. Those are the goals. Let's talk about effects, whether or not it all makes sense and works in reality. is Because there is a lot of buzz, there are a lot of people talking about it. So it's not that straightforward, I'd say. Actually, it's slightly controversial, but that there has been one study in particular that um, targeted people that try to understand and evaluate the effectiveness of microdosing versus placebo. So the design of the study is absolutely brilliant. It's double-blind placebo study. I don't know whether or not it tells you anything, but basically they made sure that uh, the effects are clear and you can distinguish whether or not it was microdosing of entheogens or it was placebo. So they ran the study over the course of the few weeks and as a result of that study, they found out that there was no significant difference between people who consumed microdose of entheogens and people who consumed placebo. So there are two things here to consider. So first of all, the effects are not that significant, as you can understand, if you cannot distinguish it from placebo. However, there is another aspect to it that I'd like you to think about, is the placebo effect itself. So when people are being told that they're consuming microdosing and when they're following a specific protocol, it seems that it works. So they weren't able to distinct to highlight a significant difference between the placebo and microdosing of entheogens. The thing is that people in both groups, in placebo and microdosing, had an improvement in various aspects, such as mood, for instance, uh, and focus, and, uh, and not only that. So the idea here is that our brain is very powerful and very capable of shaping our reality. So if we believe in something, it may in fact work. So this is the beauty of it. However, there are other studies, of course, that showcase the effectiveness of in theogens in the context of microdosing and in particularly in treating ADHD syndrome. So the idea here is that yes, microdosing is effective, but the effects are not that incredibly significant. So you need to bear that in mind. So you can understand now that indeed it is effective, but there are further studies that are required to understand the real effects of substances on people. Let's talk about protocols. So there are several protocols and you need to remember that I'm again talking about two specific substances that I mentioned at the very beginning of this episode. However, interestingly enough, in one of the studies, the, the one that studied the people with ADHD, there was one particular person who microdosed on ayahuasca and I don't really understand how did they do it. Because ayahuasca is very different <laughs> from other entheogens. But let's put that story aside and go back to the protocols. So I tried to gather information about five main protocols. I'm gonna go through each and every one of them in this sort of bad detail. So the first protocol is called... It's not first because it's the best, it's just first because, <laughs> okay? So don't pay extra attention to it and then don't, don't try to figure out whether I'm talking about most popular protocols. Remember that each and every protocol may differ depending on your personality, depending on your physiology, depending on other aspects. So just to give you an idea, I use one specific protocol and then I tried a different one. The first one that I tried, my wife didn't like. It didn't work for her. But let's go back to protocol. So the first one, not the most important, but just the first one, is called the Fadiman protocol. It is roughly one in four days. So you take first dose on the first day, doesn't matter which day it is, 
So remember 10 to 20 micrograms of LSD or 760 to 1500 milligrams or 1.5 grams of mushrooms, not actual substance. And you take the dose on the first day, on the second day you kind of still feel the aftermath, although I don't understand whether or not you feel it. In my view you're not gonna feel shit, but anyway, you, ideally you shouldn't be feeling microdosing, although you may feel some alterations of perception of reality, but not thing significant. So you can notice that colors are slightly brighter, or that your mood is changed, it's slightly better, you're definitely more focused, but there are other things that may come up and I'll talk about them, because it is important to touch that topic. So Fatty Man Protocol, you take on the first day, second day you leave and observe, and the third day is the integration, and then on the fourth day you take again. So you continue this for the duration of four to eight weeks and then you make a pause for the duration of two to four weeks. And this is pretty much same for each and every protocol. So you do it for the duration of one to two months and you rest for half a month or one month. It doesn't mean that you definitely need to stick to that particular schedule, however, those are the dates and those are the estimates of the protocols. So the second one, I don't know how to call it, but it's basically two days in a week. So again, slightly similar, you take it on the first day, second day you observe, third day you try to integrate, and then either on the fourth or third day of the week you take the second dose of the substance. Same. Four to eight weeks, rest two to four weeks. Not gonna repeat it, it goes for each protocol. Third protocol is it's called alternating, and if I'm not mistaken, this is the protocol that is being used in the clinical trials. How does it work? Basically, one in two days. You take in the first day, and the second day you take a pause, you don't take it the substance, then you take it on the third day, and the fourth day again you don't take it, so one, 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 and on and on and on. Schedule is the same. Fourth protocol is called intuitive, and well, it explains it, right? So there is no specific protocol, you do however you see fit, maybe even each day, but the thing with the microdosing is that you shouldn't be exceeding the dose per day, okay? So remember about that. Fifth protocol is by Paul Stamets, and Paul Stamets is widely known mycologist, so he has his own approach, which is slightly different from the rest, because he suggests combining psilocybin with other functional mushrooms, such as lion's mane and niacin, so niacin is nicotine acid, basically, but it doesn't mean that you need to smoke or use a nicotine patch or anything like that, there is a pill form, and if I remember correctly, it's 1000 milligrams of niacin, but please double check me on that. So how does it work? For the duration of four consecutive days, you consume both psilocybin, lion's mane, and niacin. You pause for three days, don't take anything, and then four days, again, you continue with psilocybin, lion's mane, and niacin, or niacin, I don't know how to pronounce it properly. Again, this is the protocol. The last one is called Nine Night Cap, and it is a specifically named protocol so that it gives you an idea of how you consume the substance. Basically, you do it prior to going to sleep, and they say you may combine it with the copy. It is the, the plant that is being used in uh, ayahuasca brew. So yeah, one other thing that is important to mention is that other protocols are for morning consumption, either prior to breakfast or after it. I suggest going before, but it's your decision, your call, better don't do it than do it. <laughs> but the last one is specifically designed to be used during night time and to improve the quality of sleep. So one thing that is extremely important when we're talking about microdosing protocols is that it still affects psyche in the sense that the border between your conscious and subconscious is being eliminated in a sense. 
So there is some material then can rise up from your subconscious to a everyday conscious life. And if you're not prepared to deal with it, you may have a hard time. So it is absolutely fundamentally critical to take care of integration. It is not about consumption on its own. It is about self-awareness, self-perception, being self-conscious and log your emotions, log whatever the hell is happening with you, understand which thoughts are changing depending on the day. Ideally, you need to keep a diary for the duration of entire microdosing protocol. If you're taking it for five weeks, then write the diary for the duration of all five weeks and then during the rest period as well. Because you need to understand what is happening, you need to understand what type of material is manifests itself, right? So this is psychedelic, after all, it's mind manifesting, so don't forget about that. You cannot just continue consuming entheogens with microdose and hope that your psyche is not going to bring you gifts. It will. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. So for you to integrate, it is best to have a trained psychologist or a psychiatrist or a person who you can rely on or get help when necessary because ideally there should be somebody who could help you process the thoughts that you are having and help you integrate it in your daily life and in your psyche. So today Hopefully, I was clear enough and I talked about microdosing versus macrodosing, the difference in, in the quantity of the substance. There are two main substances being used for microdosing. It's LSD and psilocybin. And of course, there are various protocols. It is up to you to decide which one's better for you. But don't ever forget, it is fundamentally critical to integrate the knowledge, to integrate the material that's being manifested by your psyche. If you have any questions, put them in the comments. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. If you want me to dig into any particular aspect of entheogens or the therapeutic thing of it, please do let me know. Thank you for your time and thank you for watching and until next time.